Hey everyone. Chapter four is just going to serve as kind of an introduction to the functional group alkenes. And we'll look at some basic structural components of, of them. And then we'll go through some nomenclature rules. Um, so overall, this chapter should be relatively short and sweet. The next chapter that we look at will cover reactions of alkenes, and that will be a much more in-depth look at them. So I know that you guys already learned all of your organic functional groups. And if you recall, an alkene is where you have a carbon-carbon double bond present in a molecule. And if we look at the geometry, what we're referring to is just one of the carbons of that double bond. So if we hone in on just one of those carbons and we look at how many things we have around it, we have one, two, and then this whole group would be three. So essentially, when you have a carbon-carbon double bond, each one of those is an AX3 type molecule. And so that means that the geometry of an alkene is trigonal planar. So they're flat, they're planar. And we're definitely going to come back to that aspect of them being planar when we look at their reactions in Chapter 5. The bond angles for an AX3 type molecule are 120 degrees apart. And the hybridization of either one of those carbons is going to be sp2 hybridized. So if we look at something like ethylene, which is the simplest alkene you can have, where we have just one carbon-carbon double bond, the formula would be C2H4. What we have here is we have a sigma bond that represents the sp2-sp2 carbon overlap right along the internuclear axis. And then in each of the other sp2 hybrid orbitals, we're overlapping with a 1s orbital on each of the hydrogens. So these blue spheres represent the other sp2 hybrid orbitals. And all of those are also sigma bonds. So this would be a sigma bond here, 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 and here. Now recall that a pi bond is made up of a sigma bond and a pi bond, or a double bond is made up of a sigma bond and a pi bond. So in order to have that pi bond present, you have to have unhybridized p orbitals. And so above and below the axis here, we have an unhybridized p orbital on each carbon atom. And that overlap above and below represents one pi bond. And so those electrons in an alkene that sit perpendicular to the plane, we said that the alkene was planar, because we have those p orbitals that are perpendicular to that above and below the plane, those electrons in those p orbitals are more loosely held, which means they're more available to react. And so that's going to be the kind of stuff we have to analyze when we start looking at reactions and why electrons flow the way they do. We also previously talked about isomers. Constitutional isomers, or in other words, just isomers, are molecules that have the same molecular formula, but they have different atom connectivity. So the atoms are actually connected in different ways. If we compare one butene to two butene, so I'll draw the structure here, we will learn the naming system in a little bit, but bute we learn was the prefix we used for four. So there's gonna be four carbons in this chain. And the one indicates that I have a double bond actually in between carbon one and two. And then if I draw the line bond structure for two butene, so it's still bute, which is four, so four carbons, but the two means that I have a double bond in between carbons two and three. And this is all something we'll go over more in depth, but that number out front basically tells you the location of the double bond. So these two would be considered isomers of one another. They're isomers because it's butene still. No matter what, they're both butene. They just have different atom connectivity in the location where that double bond is. 
Now we're going to compare that to something called stereoisomers, which we're actually going to spend a whole chapter on stereoisomers later in the semester. But that is a molecule that has the same atom connectivity, but a different 3D arrangement. So a stereoisomer will have the atoms connected identically, but when you look at them in 3D space, they are different. So now we'll compare two molecules, cis-2-butene and trans-2-butene. Z-2-butene is the same thing as cis, that's just another name for it, and E-2-butene is another name for trans. We'll be learning that. But you can see that these two stereoisomers have different properties. They have different boiling points even. So stereoisomers don't have the same physical properties. So even though the atoms are connected, uh, the same, having that different 3D arrangement causes them to have different physical properties. So cis-2-butene looks like this. We have four carbons, and the double bond is still between positions 2 and 3, which is what that number 2 meant right there. But the cis means that these two methyl groups at the end are on the same side. And we'll see that using cis and trans has really limited use, actually, when describing the stereo uh, chemistry of a molecule, but we can use it for very simple ones. Versus trans-2-butene is actually the same molecule we drew on the previous page. So in between positions 2 and 3, there's a double bond, but the end CH3 groups now, notice they are on opposite sides. We say that one is pointed up and the other is pointed down. So this one would be up from the double bond, and this one would be down from the double bond. Whereas in our cis arrangement, notice in this one they're both pointed down. They could just as easily have both been pointed up. But the point is, is that they're on the same side of that double bond. And so cis and trans are useful when you're just looking at simple alkenes where essentially you have just two groups coming off and that's all we have here so we can use that nomenclature to describe them but they're stereoisomers because they have that different 3d arrangement even though they're both 2-butene notice that we said that the stereoisomers cis-2-butene and trans-2-butene have their own physical properties they had different boiling points and so that means that these two do not interconvert into one another. They stay their own molecule. Alkanes, we learned when we looked at Newman projections, they are always spinning and the sigma bonds are always rotating. So we had tons of confirmations that we could look at for different alkanes. That was because the carbon was sp3 hybridized. But now that our carbon of our alkene is sp2 hybridized and we have a sigma and a pi bond here, we don't have any free rotation that takes place. So I can't just say that I'm going to switch this methyl group and place it up top there and have trans butene and that there's going to be some conversion there. It's not going to happen because in order for that to happen, you would actually have to break the pi bond that sits above and below the axis. And that's what actually makes alkenes rigid. They do not have any kind of interconversion or rotation like that. They're planar molecules that are rigid due to having that uh, sigma bond and pi bond. When comparing different stereoisomers of alkenes, some of them are lower in energy, that means they're more stable, and some of them are higher in energy, which means that they are less stable molecules. So here we have one pentene, and then we have two e pentene, which would be an example of trans for now. We'll come back to the E out front later. And then we have 2-pentene, which would represent our cis version of it. So the bottom two are stereoisomers because they're cis and trans of both 2-pentene. And the top ones represent isomers, 1-pentene and 2-pentene, because they have, different, uh, a, they have different connectivity of their atoms. The double bond is actually in a different location. So if you remember when we learned Newman projections, we talked about steric strain, other words, steric hindrance that can occur when you have two large bulky groups that are being forced close to one another. And steric hindrance is actually what makes cis isomers less stable than trans isomers. So cis isomers 
are going to be higher in energy, trans isomers are going to be lower in energy. So if we look at our trans isomer of 2-pentene, notice that we have a methyl group on that side pointed down, and we have an ethyl group on that side pointed up from the double bond. They're on opposite sides or opposite faces. So that means that they are not having any interactions with each other since they're on opposite faces of that double bond. Versus our cis stereoisomer, here we have a methyl group that's pointed up and we have an ethyl group that's pointed up. You can see how these two could more easily have interactions and have steric strain because they're on the same face of the double bond. And we talk about faces usually, I mean, whether you say side or faces, it doesn't matter, but it's because that double bond is planar that we are talking about an up face and a down face. So if you imagine you have a piece of paper lying in front of you, and you could think about something coming down on the top on that paper, or you could reach under that paper and have something pointed uh, coming off the bottom of it. So you could have an up face or you could have a down face to that piece of paper. And that's what you can think about your alkene like. And so that means that our trans isomer overall is going to be more stable because it has less steric strain. Some alkenes also have more groups coming off of the double bond than others. So we'll look at a graph in a minute, but at most you can have four groups coming off of your carbon-carbon bond, two on each side. And at least you could have none. You could have it with all hydrogens, as we saw in something like ethylene. So hyperconjugation is a new concept. And what it, it tells us essentially is what alkene is going to be more stable than another based upon the number of groups that are coming off of it. And we'll use hyperconjugation for other things throughout organic chemistry because it's a stabilizing effect that occurs due to the interaction of the empty p orbital on the alkene and a neighbored filled CC or CH sigma bond. So a neighboring substituent that has a carbon-carbon sigma bond or a carbon-hydrogen sigma bond. So the more opportunities that there are for hyperconjugation, meaning the more groups that there are coming off of your alkene, the more stable that alkene will be because hyperconjugation is good. It stabilizes the alkene. So this part right here represents our sigma bond of our alkene. These two top ones would represent our pi bond, and these are our unhybridized p orbitals. Those unhybridized p orbitals get stabilized when electrons get donated and pushed towards them. So what this carbon over here represents is that neighboring filled carbon-carbon bond. So this would be a sigma bond in between our alkene and then some substituent coming off of here. And so that sp3 hybrid orbital on that neighboring carbon can donate its electron density back towards that p orbital on the alkene. So this is going to stabilize our alkene. And the more opportunities that we have for hyperconjugation to occur, the more stable our alkene will be. This p orbital right here that is becoming more stabilized due to the hyperconjugation could be empty, it could be partially filled, or it could be a pi bond. Any one of those three uh, scenarios could get stabilized due to hyperconjugation. So it doesn't have to just be an empty p orbital, but thinking about it like being an empty p orbital does help it help you make sense of it a little bit because if your neighboring CC or CH sigma bond is pushing electron density through that sigma bond back towards that P orbital, you are providing some negative charge to it, therefore helping stabilize it. So this table shows us the stability of alkenes. At the top, we have the least stable, meaning the highest in energy. And at the bottom, 
we have the lowest in energy, which would represent our most stable alkene. And remember, hyperconjugation is the phenomenon that is stabilizing our alkenes. We'll talk more about hyperconjugation when we learn about carbocations and how they uh, play in reactions, essentially. So on an unsubstituted alkene, that means that all four locations are filled by hydrogen atoms. There's no R groups coming off. Remember, an R group is just some random carbon group. When we have a monosubstituted alkene, we have three hydrogens and we have one R group. That's a little bit more stable than unsubstituted. There's one opportunity for hyperconjugation. When we have a disubstituted alkene, we learned that disubstituted can be cis or trans. And we said that cis was less stable than trans. So in a cis disubstituted alkene, the two R groups are on the same side. And then getting a little bit more stable, we have a trans disubstituted alkene where the R groups are on opposite sides. Tri-substituted, three of our hydrogens have been replaced with R groups. And then the most stable alkene is a tetra-substituted alkene where all four have been replaced with R groups. So four opportunities for hyperconjugation to occur.